Hare Krishna Shamantru. Welcome Hare back Krishna. to the Mox Podcast. Thank you so much for allowing me to come on board again. Oh, it's it's a pleasure and a delight to have you. So, what what do you think we should discuss today? Uh, just something I uh, read on Quora, and also I think I liked that particular theme. Uh, when we talk in terms of students. Uh, studying theology every religion or every religious path is kind of studied researched or observed on various parameters who is the founder of that particular religion what is a sacred book what are the set of rules and then there are other sundry things which sometimes they are more important than even the essence of the message and that is does it divide between us and them like those who follow and those who don't and then the prospects of following that particular uh, path that is whether you get rewarded with residence in heaven or you are condemned in hell so these are some things which uh, kind of picked my interest uh, one small thing iskon also was seen as a new religious movement and uh, that was very strange because proper never claimed i am bringing something new uh, his standard answer was i am trying to remind you what you have forgotten and he remained true to that so these are some of the broad uh, subject which uh, maybe we'll discuss in one setting or we can have two or three parts for that so basically i would put questions for you and then both of us can see where the discussion leads us yes certainly yes please go ahead all right so does iskon have a founder in the sense of buddha is seen as a founder of a religion mohammed is seen as a founder of a religion and lord jesus is seen as a founder of a religion Hmm. We would say yes and no, or we could start with no and yes. No, in the sense that there is, the tradition has been, uh, from its traditional old perspective, it is co-eternal with existence. I mean, from a historical perspective, it goes on for thousands of years, thousands and thousands of years. And uh, if we consider whether we talk about the Bhagavad Gita or the Bhagavatam, which are our core books. they themselves describe the tradition of krishna bhakti which is going back further back into history so it is we doesn't have a founder in that sense now shila prabhupad did use the word founder acharya to describe himself what we could say is that he is he founded a particularly particular kise organized or institutionalized expression of a tradition that goes back to that traces itself back to divinity so mm. we could say that so that's that would be my answer no and yes what about you all right i am always uh, impressed and that satisfied me intellectually when um, in many conversations and purports also in lectures proper would say that religion can never be manufactured by man Uh, you would always quote dharmam tu sakshat bhagavat pranitam in as much as an individual cannot enact state laws although to be uh, cons- I mean, to be consistent individuals can make state laws in today's modern democracy we can say something like that but no one individual can say today i don't feel like following this particular law the laws to be given by the state only from that clear cut understanding religion means the laws of god dharmam tu sakshat bhagavat pranitam and as you rightly pointed out um along with the creation comes the instruction manual along with the manufactured product along with your gadget with your iphone comes the instruction booklet so that is a vedic understanding that along with the creation the rules to be 
observe for our Vedanta Krit Veda Vid. I am the one who has given the Vedanta, I have compiled Vedanta, and therefore I have to be seen as the uh, maintainer. The Tir Bharata Prabhu Shakshi Nivasa Sharanam Sri Nivasa and the shelter uh, given. I am the Okay, Sharanam is the shelter given. What could Nivasa mean? Somewhere where you rest in or inhabit? Yeah, so it's not just a shelter giver, but also the shelter. But I think okay, that's... yeah, yeah. In that sense. So, so in that sense, a follower of uh, Bhagavad Gita would put Krishna as the founder of um, this uh, understanding of Sanatana Dharma. Yes, that's true. So now, you want to put Krishna as the founder, then that brings the question, Then, when Prabhupada said he's the founder Acharya, what exactly does that mean then? In that sense, an Acharya has three broad connotations. The simplest level or the basic level Acharya is a Sanskrit teacher. They are always called Acharya of Acharya. Uh, Sanskrit in the sense where the culture which is coded in Sanskrit language, somebody who has an ashram, somebody who teaches students, very basic level. Second level Acharya is somebody who follows a particular system of uh, Vedic tradition and there are many of such Acharyas. There could be many. And a founder Acharya or a Sanstapak Acharya is a very high post where somebody has suggested, enacted or emphasized upon following a particular set of codes as long as that institution exists. So that's, that's uh, the third understanding of Prabhupada as a founder Acharya is a very, very precisely clear and a very important one. It's a very exalted place. So he's, he's not just a teacher. He, did, he didn't just teach his followers to chant, dance, cook, or perform duty worship. He was not simply somebody who presided over establishment of temples. He was someone who kind of translated uh, ancient codes or ancient rules and regulations to fit the modern milieu, the modern environment, and insisted that this is how things should be done as long as this institution exists. So that's why uh, he's called the preeminent instructing teacher. Mm. Okay. Should we move on to the next uh, broad-based topic? Yeah, please. Okay, so uh, Iskon was uh, kind of put in that bracket of a new religious movement till Western scholars uh, intervened. And among those who intervened, a few names, I may be missing out a few, uh, Dr. Sir Edward, Edward Dimuk, then um, I, I think uh, Klaus Kostenmeyer, Francis Clooney, and then um, it, it was it Edward Dimuk who wrote The Wonder That Was India? El Basham. Basham, Basham, okay. Basham. Dr. El Basham. So, so these are the scholars who would then tell either American law enforcement authorities that suddenly a group of Americans chanting Hare Krishna in the street. Is this a cult? Is this a hippie movement? Is this a show? Is this a protest? What exactly is that? Funnily, our Jagannath Ratyatra was described as, oh, this parade doesn't involve breaking glasses. <laughs> okay. so, so far from knowing that it is an ancient religious rite or a tradition. This was how the Western lens was seeing ISKCON. So now, now this is a very important topic nowadays. 
So we have Krishna as a founder and his book Gita as the book. So my first question or first point is, is the Gita only the book or it is part of the book? The, well, the Gita itself quotes other books and the Gita doesn't really say that yes. this is itself the sole book. And Gita gives certain truths. And I would say that the truths that are given in the Gita are what are important. What makes the, the book is important because it is conveying truths. Now, of course, the tradition will consider the book itself as divine, as sacred, because it's considered to be like the manifestation of the divine. But there is no exclusivity seen in the teachings of the Gita, as far as I can see. That it doesn't claim that it is the sole book you should read, nor does it claim that the teachings that are found there are not found anywhere else. And that's why all it has made all other books redundant. In, what do you think? Yeah, to quote uh, one favorite quote of mine from a very exalted Maharashtrian saint, Santapukara, Gita Bhagavata Kariti Patanam Akhanda Chintana Vithobhats. He says in old trusting Marathi uh, that, O oh, people, Hmm. Read Gita along with the Bhagavad. So, of course, anybody part of Iskon knows that Gita is Krishna's teachings and Bhagavad is the various incarnations of Krishna. Or to put it into one line, I heard one senior devotee say, there is something which Krishna speaks about himself and in some book, others speak about Krishna. So, Gita, Krishna talks about himself. And how great he is. Now, some may not agree with that. So the Bhagavad describes other grades telling you how great Krishna is. Okay, beautiful. Yeah. So, uh, Gita Bhagavad Kariti Patana, read both of them. Akhanda Chintana Vithoba. Vithoba, of course, is a name of Krishna, Panduranga in Pandarpur. So, all along, right from, say, at least uh, for centuries, Devotees of Krishna would take the Gita along with the Bhagavad. And as you rightly said, this is the book because in 700 concise verses, it gives you so much. But it doesn't put other books uh, kind of considering them less important or redundant as you rightly said. Would you like to add something more on that? Yeah. Another point would be if I consider the, the Gita's teachings, the, the Gita also, you could say it doesn't have one teaching. It has multi-level teachings. And its teachings also progress from one level to another. And uh, if we look at those teachings, either through specific technical terms, or we look at them from overall conceptual uh, vision. So technical terms like say Karma Yoga or Bhakti Yoga might be specific Vedic terms. But the idea of working with devotion, or working in a mood of selfless contribution, we could we could see these concepts themselves are universal. So in that sense, the Gita provides a universal framework for living, and different texts, different paths, different individuals can fit at various levels within that framework. So, so in that sense, the Gita is an inclusive book, not an exclusive book. Okay. So by now, whenever yeah, sorry, sorry let's clarify what I mean by that is exclusive means this is the only way and there's no other way. Uh, but rather the, the Gita says is actually Mama Vartamanu Vartante Manushaha Partha Sarvasha. That all people are on my path. So rather than saying that only those who follow follow the teachings of the Gita are on the right path, the Gita says actually the Gita is describing a path that is inclusive. Now, different people may be at different levels on that path. Different people may be going in different directions on that path. But Krishna says, all people are on my path. So, in that sense, it's a, that's what I meant by uh, it doesn't exclude anyone. Its ambit, its scope includes everyone. That's what it is, how it is exclusive, inclusive, not exclusive. All right. So, somebody who discovers the Bhagavad Gita or somebody who comes to know about it, reads it, gets uh, 
affected in a positive way does the gita uh, like today's people can just reasonably ask that does it divide humanity whether somebody accepts krishna and worship krishna or someone who doesn't do that and this is something which is very striking about the gita we could say the gita has two distinct value systems one is the value system based on the modes and another is the value system based on devotion hmm? so based on the modes it talks about people in goodness passion ignorance now again the nomenclature may be specific but if you understand the description of the nomenclature any thoughtful person will understand that say a person who lives in goodness is going to contribute more to the society and they are actually going to do greater justice to their own abilities also uh, live a better life live a, and a person in ignorance is going to live a destructive life so that's one value system where it's where it's it's universal and in one sense in the value system analysis based on the modes the gita doesn't focus on divinity that means irrespective of your conception of the divine irrespective of one's attitude towards the divine there is a behavioral framework for analysis in the gita and it could so from this behavioral perspective uh, we could say that there could be an atheist who might be in goodness in terms of their behavior and there might be a theist who might be in passion or ignorance so the gita in that sense from the perspective of the mores of modes does not actually divide anyone it gives a very objective criteria for for again placing everyone at a particular uh, at the appropriate level in the hierarchy now even uh, so I, before i go ahead maybe you would like to comment something on this then i can talk about the other value system the devotional value system so you 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 finish up both so that we get a balance view of uh, both these the doctrines okay then the the devotional value system is where the gita focuses more on what is being uh, what is your attitude toward the supreme divinity the gita reveals that divinity to be krishna and in that divinity the gita's idea is that uh, those who are devoted to the devoted devoted to the lord they are considered to be the most enlightened beings and they are considered to have achieved the summit of the purpose they come they attain the purpose and perfection of life to whatever extent we can become perfect now having said that the gita also has a section in the 12th chapter where it talks specifically about how those de- those who are devoted also have to manifest virtues so in that sense the framework of the modes and the framework of devotion somebody for somebody to be considered on top of the framework of devotion they cannot do that if they are they are also they are not manifesting virtues also so the two frameworks at the peak of both of them coincides that means the krishna also says the way to transcend the modes the best way to transcend the modes to is by the path of by practicing devotion unflinchingly but now why is this concerned with we and they because within the devotional world view there might be the idea that these are devotees and these are as i say non devotees uh, a more uncomplimentary term for it would be godly or ungodly divine and demoniac there could be different ways of looking at it but the point is that the gita doesn't have while it uses the for the broad purpose of analysis divine and demoniac natures but the gita is a part of the mahabharat and most of the characters in the mahabharat actually fall they're not directly explicitly divine nor are they explicitly demoniac some are but most of them fall in the middle of the spectrum uh, with various shades of black and white and the gita does point to that or uh, rather it really talks about the three modes and how these three modes mix with each other and it also talks about how sometimes those who are devoted may sometimes do wrongful actions and how that is to be seen so in that sense i don't see a, a typical vide mentality in the gita what are your thoughts yeah i just uh, remembered something from a very distant field of economics and politics first it was the western developed nation the first world and then the underdeveloped nations 
and they thought that, well, this is not a very good term to use. So they started calling them LDCs, the least developed countries. That also was seen as, you know, why put a remark on somebody's development? So then it was developed and developing nations. Okay, that's interesting. So, okay. so even in dry, dual matters of economics and politics, people don't like this thing. So when we say, these are the saints, and these are the saints in training, something like that. <laughs> okay. The devotees and potential devotees. Exactly. Mm. So, so, yeah, so uh, I'm just very happy to see this uh, two value systems. So, uh, just if I can understand it, as you said, one talks about the modes which act no matter what, whatever you say. Like somebody can be a professed devotee, quote unquote, putting on the ropes or the clay markings or the neck beads or having chanting beads. At the same time, maybe struggling very hard with the load motor of passion and ego. So I, I just uh, made a point before we began this recording. Somebody gets admitted to Harvard Law, Harvard Law School, reputedly one of the best law schools. Hmm. So should we say he has a chance to be tutored in the best law school? Or after graduation, he will prove to be the best attorney? Or the best lawyers, so to say. So somebody accepts the Bhagavad Gita, does it mean that he will be the best, uh, like Prabhupada said, my followers would be, the, would be gentlemen. So is it understood that just by accepting it, he is bound to be the ge best gentleman ever? Or he has a chance of becoming a gentleman? That's a beautiful report. So there is no, because we see in our, in the Bhagavad Gita culminates in Bhakti Yoga and the Bhakti path has been elaborated in the various Bhakti texts and they give a long trajectory for a seeker to become a seer. And that involves a significant level of purification. That's very and, nicely put. Sorry? Seeker to seer. That's very nicely put. Seeker yeah. to seer. Yeah. So... In that sense, we, do, we can't really say that uh, it's just like accepting or believing something whitewashes a person. It is not that way. It is it, it is the beginning of a journey. So that your Harvard example is very good that there is a certain amount of, we could say, fortune getting into that university, that kind of Ivy League institute. Now, what the Bhagavad Gita talks about is that although the path of devotion is the highest, it is also, we could say, the most liberal in the sense that it welcomes everyone. So the only qualification for beginning the path of devotion is, is the desire. The desi if there is a desire, then one will get the mercy, the grace and one will start the path. So in that sense, like Harvard opening its uh, doors for anyone to join. Hmm? But it is just because anyone can join doesn't mean anyone is going to graduate. So the Bhakti path has this. It is, it is very, very, uh, very, very, you could say, what is, I want to use the word of non-demanding non or accommodating in terms of anyone whom it invites. But it is also very demanding in terms of who it elevates or who gets elevated. So everybody is invited into the bhakti path, but they have to pass the tests. They have to actually reject lower desires, get purified, manifest virtue, and then they rise to the topmost level. Any, any thoughts on this? Yeah, that, that was very nicely put. I just got this uh, kind of uh, one-liner that invitation is for everyone. Elevation, elevation is for those who put in the effort. That's beautiful. Yes, that's nicely put. Everyone so, is invited, but that doesn't mean everyone will be elevated. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some people say that the notion of heaven, which is like a nice place. Okay, just one minute. Uh, is how, also, just one, so can we categorically say there is no Vide mentality? Because we do see, say, among uh, uh, current uh, practitioners of Bhakti, the very word term when we use non-devotees. So is it more of a 
a functional designation rather than a philosophical designation so i sometimes sometimes i'm not even comfortable with the word non devotee sometimes yeah. you go non non practitioner or something like that but uh, so the we they although it, it at a functional level every country or every group will need that say for example as hmm. indian citizen and uh, whatever be the word you know illegal immigrant or america the political word is undocumented citizen or something like that uh, un- undocumented uh, person or whatever so there has to be some functional designation to to convey belonging and non belonging but there's a difference between that functional designation and a uh, a philosophical evaluation or philosoph- philosophical proclamation isn't it true very true the model which comes to my mind is uh, you finished your point yeah i finished it yes that uh, in a hospital the administration at least has to see the consultants the ward boys the nurses the patients and those who are recovered patients now you can't say because this hospital loves everybody we are all one based upon the infection based upon how much bacteria or viruses have infected your body you will be treated as a high risk patient a low risk patient a icu patient or a recovered patient or soon to be discharged person so once you are discharged you are no longer a patient but as you said for the sake of functionality that discussion that uh, differentiation has to be made but it is not held against a person that oh you are sick and therefore you are condemned or how dare you fall sick not in that sense interesting so there are two things that came to my mind there is one is the we they mentality when when we that's talked about it is more of a, a not just it's it's the not a moral evaluation but it's not just a moral evaluation also it's almost like a matter of privilege and we are the chosen people and maybe you are the condemned people or whatever so in one sense everybody is included in the circle of god's love because everybody is eternally uh, the and eternally considered to be a loving part of god so in that so the we they is more of a functional where one, functional marker of where one may be presently on the spiritual journey so no i real i the, there's some difference between say spiritual and religious and the spiritual but not religious is a very common way of looking at uh, of differentiating in the western world today in the post modern mind but one idea is that you know, every system need some kind of hierarchy for functioning at the same time there has to be some sense of equality hmm? so when one becomes more religious than spiritual then the hierarchy the vision of hierarchy uh, trumps or supersedes or eclipses the vision of equality so this is a brahmana and i am pure and you are a shudra and you are you are filthy you are untouchable and just stay out of away from me so when the religious vision supersedes the spiritual vision then the hierarchy uh, is over a hierarchy overpowers equality whereas when the spiritual vision arises above the religious vision then hierarchy may be seen but equality is what is emphasized and that's why we have this verse vidya vinaya sampanne so the, the the person the, the brahmana the the seer is acknowledging for a functional level this is a brahmana this is a this is a chandala this is a person who is having this kind of behavioral habit this is a person having this kind of behavioral habits but he says that they are all parts of god so i think this is a so there is a vidya mentality in a functional level but if the functional itself becomes the uh, overall vision then it can lead to an exclusive mentality any thoughts on this so a practitioner does yeah so the practitioner does keep the we or they idea alive in his or her mind but doesn't allow that to cloud his uh, his lens at which he sees the world can you put it like that 
yes that's true yeah so another way i i thought is that there might be we might the labels we understand that they they are actually super they are peripheral and ephemeral temporarily it's not that this person is permanently going to be a brahmana this person is permanently going to be a shudra okay temporarily they are there i think the the story of the bharat Mah- bharat maharaj when he becomes jadbharti says today i am a poor person and you are the king and tomorrow i may be the king and you might be a poor person mm. but don't be so proud of your don't be so carried away by your positions right now the last point i had is this that <clears throat> now that you have decided to join any kind of path there is some bonanza some gift which is offered and uh, more or less it is in terms of a heavenly atmosphere heavenly existence after this existence or eternal heaven or whatever what is the heaven that geeta promises if at all it promises anything like that uh, the geeta's cosmology is is quite sophisticated and there are multiple levels of existence so we could say that there is the terrestrial level that is where we are living then there is subterranean level below us then there is a celestial level and beyond it all there is a transcendental level so the gita's cosmology is that depending on the kind of actions the, the gita's cosmology is associated also with the seeker's consciousness so so the now the depending on the consciousness a person may get elevated to various places within the within the cosmology so and then of course i think uh, so that's what would be my first answer there could be many more but i think you can comment also then at this stage i i like this very much the differentiation between heaven so there is a subterranean heaven well all the while i was told that subterranean means basically pluto's kingdom all hellish but as we read the bhagavatam the situation is hellish but the enjoyment is heavenly <laughs> for example okay for example in today's world there could be a completely drug ridden mafia driven high crime area which may offer you profuse gambling illicit sex or all kinds of uh, uh, buffet which i mean non veg uh, food items or whatever music song dance but at the same time it is in one of the worst crime infested areas of a particular city so this is what came to my mind when i read about the subterranean heavenly planets people are very angry cursing each other fighting at the drop of a hat but at the same time some uh, huge level of material sense gratification is offered there then you put it nicely as a terrestrial heavenly planet which may come and may go like kashmir uti and some of the places in india there was this poet who saw kashmir and he says that if at all there is paradise on earth there it is here it is now for the last 30 years kashmir has been anything but a paradise with over 85000 dead so in this terrestrial atmosphere we may have something being paradise or something may not be celestial paradise is also kind of time bound because we hear about the benefits of being born there or getting a body there but also in the eighth canto we read about that realm being attacked by equally powerful same celestial personalities but not uh, not the devtas not the demigods so all the three levels of heavens uh, are kind of discounted in the bhagavad gita that one may not keep them as the main goal of his or her spiritual path or spiritual pursuit rather than that that fourth one the transcendental realm of heaven is it even precise to call it heaven seeing the paltry definition of heaven we see in the other three cases yeah it's a good point sometimes there is a 
limitation with respect to the vocabulary so i see that prabhupad in the juhu temple he called it as heaven on earth now i asked the project <laughs> yes. i asked the project managers why prabhupad used the word and he said that prabhupad here in this convince in this sense he uh, went along with the idea that uh, you know, people consider heaven to be a very wonderful place so for new people spiritual world on the earth is not as attractive as heaven on earth so sometimes okay. we may we may defer to the uh, we may defer to the commonly understood meaning of a word even when that word has a different sense within the technical or a philosophical sense so we could call it like i i somehow i i also like this idea that we we use the word heaven and then we qualify it so you can call subterranean heaven celestial heaven and then we could say transcendental or spiritual heaven i think in one of the poetry poems of bhaktinath thakur also he uses the word heaven as a equivalent for the spiritual world i'll have to find that but i am almost positive about that so as long as we qualify any, any it, things what yeah. are the quick things which come to your mind about krishna's definition of the terrestrial terrestrial kingdom martya loka is the word he uses no no i'm talking of krishna's own kingdom how does he differentiate it from the mundane conception of heaven oh okay the first thing is eternity in the bhagavad gita's conception even heaven is not eternal heaven is also temporary because even in heaven although the life span is very long but it is not eternal so it's so long that it may seem eternal to us but it's not actually eternal whereas the whereas the krishna's abode is eternal so the spiritual heaven is actually the only eternal and then it's not only duration it's also in terms of constitution or composition heaven is also considered a part of the material world whereas uh, whereas the spiritual world or krishna's krishna's spiritual heaven is considered beyond the material world then because that which is spiritual is eternal so the two are related the duration and uh, the duration composition and also if you want to talk about one more thing is disposition that the residents in heaven still have some desires for uh, for we could say sensual pleasures although it is pious sensual pleasures bhakti nath thakur used the word religious materialists oh really pious materialist uses the word but religious materialist he uses it so there is irreligious materialism and there is religious materialism so the heavens are filled with sensual pleasures within the ambit of religion and like the reward for your performance of religion whereas the spiritual world is more with centered with simply pure loving service so duration of long duration of the ex- duration of existence the disposition of the residents and the composition of the place itself and the residents and it, these three are the defining differences i can see do you see any, any other differences not to my mind right now so i i have one last point or if you want to add something more no i'm good okay so seeing the situation today 21st century year 2021 where people are uh with the pandemic going on people are questioning so many things especially work is undergoing a sea change recreation is undergoing a sea change similarly uh i read an article where a church uh, pastor was asking his uh colleagues a question that are we doing enough to help people in the current pandemic what he meant was are we offering wisdom which is suitable in today's times where people are facing a big crunch uh, vis-a-vis resources time high stress levels uh, declining health levels and especially not finding a purpose in life so i would tell my 
thoughts first and then you can uh, add and summarize everything. So I was thinking that there are more calls for being united. For example, albeit for a temporary purpose, laboratories or private companies united to find a vaccine. Uh, there are calls for don't try to commercialize it, don't try to use a vaccine as a weapon. So we don't know how much the politicians are actually uniting it for a better cause, but at least the calls are there. So seeing this situation, we saw that the Gita doesn't divide people. The Gita doesn't make a promise of trying to be make a comfortable position here itself. You nicely put these three levels of so-called places of material sense gratification. How would uh, someone accept the message today or why would somebody accept the message today? I have one or two points. One is that as regards the purpose of life, the Gita teaches that there is a lesson to be learned even within a pandemic. Is it a curse of God? Is it the wrath of God? Is it the hammer of God coming upon us? I would say the Gita tells us that this is part of the cosmic plan. It comes under the category of uh, is it adibhautik misery? Misery is given by other uh, living entities. But when we say the virus is not exactly a living entity, so is it technically adidaivik or adibhautik? What would you say? Mm -hmm. We really open a Pandora's box here, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> well, then we'll, uh, but I'll quickly address a couple of points here. Yeah. So if we don't go into, in my understanding, these three miseries, they are not necessarily watertight compartments. Hmm. They are themselves related. And, uh, but for analytical framework, we would place, um, place them in different categories. So if we presume that they were a result of just a natural mutation, then they would be adhi daivik. But if they, if it's later research discovers that you know, they were due to either human incompetence or human malevolence, that means you know, somebody, somebody made them and then they just escaped or somebody made them for the cause, uh, some researchers made them for the cause of effect, then they would be adhi bhautik. Okay, and of course, okay. because it's a, because it's a disease infecting the body, so then we could call it adhyatmic, but then I'm not sure whether misery is, because generally when a misery is caused by the body, uh, misery is coming from the body and the mind. So I'm not sure whether all diseases would be necessarily adhyatmic alone, because we may also want to concern, consider the source from which it is coming. So I'm not sure whether you could categorize it in one way. What are your thoughts? Correct. I am really happy to see this. Uh, for me, it's a new way of looking at not seeing everything in water time. So coming to that question of uh, the Gita explains, Krishna explains in the Gita how this material nature is a very, very, very powerful agency. Krishna calls this agency his own. Mama Maya is mine. He's not a god who is only interested in hurling thunderbolts or hurling punishments. So either he did it or we invited it on, on our own heads. So since the Gita heavily emphasizes the responsibility of everyone in what happens to their life, do we understand oh. it? Is, it? is it the right way to understand? Oh, okay. You know, I, I would say that we will need a separate session to discuss what is the okay. Gita's vision of the problem of evil? If you want to go into that direction. So is it because of some say original sin or what is the cause? But broadly speaking, he, the understanding is that ultimately we have to take responsibility. That's the whole mood of the Gita. You know, for 
Now, in the Gita, if you consider, uh, Arjuna has to fight a war against his own relatives, against his venerable elders. Something he does, just doesn't want to do. Yeah. But the Gita doesn't. Although the Gita talks about karma, it talks about karma more in terms of dharma. That what is the action to be done? The Gita doesn't go so much into the analysis of uh, why. Why is Arjuna put in the situation? where he has to fight this painful war so the gita's uh, gita's focus is more on the future than on the past okay you are in the situation now uh, how can you make the best of the situation so rather than uh, and getting too much into why problems come there is the there is understanding of karma but that is not the focus of the gita the gita's focus is that uh, the gita also is gahana karmano gati how karma works is very difficult to understand so the whole mood is at focus on acting in a way that you make things better and the gita does categorically acknowledge that we by choosing responsibly can create a brighter future so if you consider the conclusion of the gita is wherever there is krishna and wherever there is arjuna there will be victory there will be opulence there will be morality there will be all good things now we could say that why is arjuna needed over there wherever there is krishna wherever there is god all goodness will actually be there isn't it but the gita includes arjuna over there because the purpose of the gita is not just to proclaim god's position it is to transform man's disposition so the gita is very clearly stating that you know the gita's purpose was to get arjuna to act responsibly and in that sense even in this pandemic whatever be the cause of it uh, which we can try to find with our intelligence as much as possible more important than that is that if each of us takes responsibility tries to become spiritually stronger then we all can be a part of the solution we all can make things better for ourselves and for for our small corner of the world that's very beautifully put there are there are people like you heard of jane goodall she is a uh, wildlife expert she is in her late 80s or something now and uh, her simple thing was would it be nice to treat animals a little bit more in a more kinder way so now this is coming from somebody who is not professing religion but the way humanity is making progress in physics chemistry and biology there has to be something a similar progress in the way we treat other living beings and sometimes as we see now not only for their good but also for our own good so this is a beautiful redefinition of progress we often think of progress in terms of our ability to control things in the past we were at the mercy of nature whenever yeah. the rains wouldn't come we would be powerless mm-hmm. but uh, now we have dams and irrigation systems so we are not so much you controlled the vagaries of nature we can say but we can talk about progress not just in terms of how much we can control things but how we are actually dealing with other beings better that's a and that's very thought provoking definition of progress so so i have reached the end of my notes if you would like to summarize or Like yeah that is beautiful so thank you for this very stimulating discussion and i think we got a lot of points which we could discuss further or we could take this discussion so broadly we discussed about uh, the conventional or the common questions that people have about religious traditions so yes. and we discussed uh, i think four or five questions first is that do we does this have a founder we could say yes. ultimately it is god krishna who is the founder and if and then specifically we could have one institutional teacher who is a prominent exemplar of the tradition for that is that is prabhupad for our particular movement then the second was about um, do we have the idea of chosen people so we discussed the value system of the modes where there is no kind of partiality or selectivity it's completely objectively based on behavior even without considering one's religious or devotional disposition and there's a value system based on devotion where there is 
there is uh, the acknowledgement that some people are devotees and some are not but but in a sense everybody is considered to be having uh, the potential for devotion and then god's loving circle embrace potentially embrace uh, includes everyone so like you, like you go the example of harvard so everybody is invited and then everybody gets elevated based on their apply, how they apply themselves and learn so it's both accommodating and demanding <clears throat> but it is not that just there is no no sense of like a default moral superiority just because you are an insider and every default moral inferiority just because somebody is an outsider mm-hmm. at a functional level designations are there but the idea is even after one becomes a seeker there is a long journey to becoming a seer and that has to be acknowledged then i also talked about the third question was the conception of heavens mm-hmm. <clears throat> and then we talked about subterranean <coughs> heavens celestial heavens and then the transcendental the transcendental is different in terms of disposition duration and composition and then i think the last thing we talked about was the problem of evil just in a broad sense so rather than focusing on what is the source of evil the gita's focus is on what is the cure for evil and the cure for evil is <clears throat> that each of us try to become more responsible and become more spiritual and then we can all be uh, become a part of the solution and and then you talked about redefining progress in terms of not how, control over things but conduct with beings yeah so, anything else i left out anything you want to add concluding no 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 i speak about anything Thank you very much. This is a very stipulated discussion. Hare Thank Krishna. You. Hare Krishna. We'll meet again. Sure.